What's up, everybody? It's time to continue on. Part three, weed series. Um, I know I love I love the saying, and I think it's very accurate. I think that people more and more appreciate it that uh, a weed isn't anything but just a plant out of place. Um, we tend to take it for granted most of the time, which is why I'm doing this series as to what uh, the presence of those weeds are telling you. Why are they in your gardens? Why are they in your flower beds? Why are they in your turf? Um, and I, I want to be sure that everybody understands and realizes that the point of this isn't to um, stop you from using controls, um, you know, using pre-emergent, using um, any broadleaf herbicides. Uh, that, that, that's not what this is about. Um, at the end of the day, you're looking for a clean and green lawn and landscape. That's really it. Uh, free of weeds, green thick lawn. So you have to control those weeds. You have to get them out of there. That's part of the process, but always making notes about what is present is going to help you when you're building your fertility program going into the future. So I'm going to preface this one in this way. Um, the products that I've been manufacturing, the ones that I've created and put out into the market were based on um, calculated findings around uh, missing pieces of programs, um, depletions of soils in different areas and different regions, um, filling in spaces, uh, and which goes back into the um, video I did about limiting factors, understanding limiting factors and um, correcting those in order to get the biggest bang for your buck out of your fertility program. So this is a similar, similar thing building it into a little bit of a different level with the weeds. Now, um, I had a few comments uh, from Jeremy Rushton at uh, Greener Lawn. He was out working in his flower beds um, the other day and was taking note of the weeds that were out there. And he sent me a couple of messages about them, um, which I answered in the comments of the last video in the part two of the series. And um, it was dandelion, um, candida thistle, uh, and I can't remember what the other one was. I think some bindweed, perhaps. So the answer to his question is those were actually all indicators of the same thing. That's a low available soil calcium. And that's what this particular video is going to be about. And so I made a list of a, a fairly common weeds um, that you would find in different parts of the country that would be indicative of a low available calcium content. And if you want to get back into the importance of calcium, jump back into the soil series. I, I did one on calcium and magnesium and um, understanding their roles and what they do. So I'm going to bridge this with what the weeds are telling you and then also how to go in and correct it. Put, pull a couple of um, looks at soil samples to see where your saturations are and go from there. So... Um, as we go through here, uh, you can take a look, start to see sort of what some of these root systems look like, what some of these leaves look like. You know, you can be identifying some of these plants, maybe you've seen them, and uh, then we can talk about ways to correct that. So here's where we're gonna go. Um, burdock uh, would be a good one to start. The, the, this is something that is eh, found on a lot of farms and, and different things like that, but it's kind of blown in and out through the uh, Midwest. Um, that one can often be, uh, for sure that's going to be low calcium, but oftentimes it's going to be a surplus of iron, uh, smooth brome grass. Sometimes you can find that. Maybe you're not going to find that so much, but, uh, let's jump down into some more common bindweed, which would be, you know, morning glory, uh, as well would fit into that category. Um, definitely indicative of low calcium. Um, a lot of these plants when you look at them and, and how they produce, uh, you can see that they have um, sort of a milkiness to them anyway. And their goal is to replenish some of this soil calcium in some cases. They can pull it down from deeper levels where, the, where your typical turf roots aren't reaching them, or it's just saying, look, this topsoil is depleted and that gives us a chance to thrive in this area. So. 
this is going to be a time when you have to go out and apply calcium. Um, and depending on what your saturations are or what your magnesium levels are, or where your pH is, we, we would have to really look at what's going to be the best option. Now, um, a liquid calcium, if you're trying to apply something like that, that's fine for a uh, plant tissue, um, deficiencies, but not necessarily for fixing soil carrier deficiencies. So you have to think about it in two different ways. Uh, there, there's no way you could get enough calcium out via a liquid form to adjust the soil. You really need to go in there and lime more gypsum or something along those lines. So I'm kind of cruising down the line, crabgrass. Crabgrass is often um, indicative of that. And we talked a little bit about that in the last one. We have a plant that's sprawling and, and covering areas. Well, if you think about nutrient deficiency, uh, th there's times when plants, some turf grasses, uh, won't choose to grow in an area because the soil is too deficient. Now you get the weeds, like we talked about, filling in those blank space. That's something that weeds really like to do. So crabgrass is another one of those. Dandelion, purslane, we mentioned those. Spurge, uh, Canada thistle, wild buckwheat, which is also in a bindweed. Um, wild onion. You know, I talked a little bit about that from what we saw at the plant in Georgia. Now that, that's another plant that not only is it indicative of a low calcium level, but of a compacted, low aerobic, uh, low organic matter soil. And in breaking it into those terms, when you're looking at um, the health of the soil, you can see a weeds pop up based on nutrient deficiency, based on uh, anaerobic conditions, based on um, moist soil conditions, based on uh, poor levels of organic matter, I mean, it, you name it. And oftentimes you can look at the root structure itself to see what these things are, are doing and what they're telling you. So, um, but these particular plants that I mentioned today and uh, the images that were coming across the screen there, so you can identify them if you see them, they are indicative of low calcium. And if you've had a soil report done, if you've taken a look at it, if you've been battling these particular kinds of weeds um, and your soil report, uh, report hasn't shown like your uh, base saturations for cal, mag, potassium, um, that those would be important to see in a test because we could be doing something as simply as adding a few pounds of, of gypsum or, or a of dolomitic lime, you know, it could be a lot. Um, I had a soil report sent to me yesterday that I was looking through that had very low cationic exchange capacity. The phosphorus was off the charts. The calcium was super low. Um, it was a low pH sandy soil condition, um, in an area that was old ag land in Florida. Um, and that's something that it's going to have to be taken care of with lime, which usually you wouldn't see because the soil there is fairly calcitic. So steps have to be taken in order to correct those deficiencies. And oftentimes when you, when you are starting with this calcium level, adding this in, um, uh, this helps to carry more oxygen down into the soil, carry more, um, nutrients on its back as it were to, to breathe more life down into the subsoil because you're not always just feeding the plants. They're, they're living there in this ecosystem. This balance has to take place and nutrients have to be in place inside that soil in order for the plants to thrive. Now, we have seen in a few different areas where, um, you know, say on golf greens and things like that, where the soil tests haven't really mattered. At one point, it sort of stopped because foliar feeding took over and it was regularly being done. So the plant was able to constantly pull through its tissue what it needed to work. So you can do that. But for most people, for lawn care professionals uh, getting out uh, for for homeowners who might be fertilizing in a lot, you're not going to go out there every five to seven days and feed something that it just doesn't really make any sense. So you need to have these reserves down in the soil, down in the bank and, and get everything cycling. So in speaking more about that, as we get into weeds that have, uh, that are showing up because of poor organic matter decay, um, or even excess in some cases, these are times when we have to start thinking about nutrients in a little bit of a different way. So uh, I, 
organic matter is very important. The decay of organic matter is actually more important. Um, you know, if you just spread a bunch of compost and buried your turf, maybe some of it's going to make through, uh, get through eventually, but you've just created an anaerobic uh, zone for the grass and it's going to be hard for it to get out. So we need to make sure that we're providing the correct nutrient loads, uh, the correct amount of oxygenating beneficial components to the program in order to break that down properly. So start thinking about that. Think about those weeds. It's very important to understand why they're there. It's very important to feed into the bank that is literally showing you in real time what's missing. So there you go. These are, these are some common ones to take a look at. Follow up with some soil reports to just see. We can start balancing out there and see if this stuff starts to make sense uh, to where we're seeing some of these deficiencies or, or even looking at your soil um, just in your hand to see what's happening out there. There's a lot of things that you can tell just from paying attention. So that's it for today. I'll talk to you guys real soon.